Okay, so this is the last of our decision tree lectures. Now, uh, I just want to go over some advantages and disadvantages of decision tree methods, in particular the greedy ones, C4.5 and CART, and their million friends, because you could create a gazillion variations of them by using different splitting and training criteria. Now, uh, the good thing about decision trees, of course, is that they're interpretable, assuming you use CART, <laughs> or at least if you print C4.5 all the way back. Um, these models handle nonlinearities very nicely because they're inherently nonlinear. Uh, they're greedy, so they're very fast to construct because you're iteratively, you know, recursively partitioning the data into smaller and smaller pieces. And they can easily handle imbalanced data by reweighting the points, but the truth is they struggle with imbalanced data. Okay, so the disadvantages are they're greedy, so they're not as accurate. They tend not to be quite as accurate as other methods like support vector machines or boosted decision trees or whatever. And they're heuristic. They're not very elegant. There's a lot of strange choices within these algorithms that it would be better if we didn't necessarily have to make them. Um, also, there's no proof of optimality. So even if you did get an optimal cart tree, you'd have no way of knowing that it was optimal. And if you didn't construct an optimal tree, you have no way of knowing that it's not optimal. So you, you don't know why you're, you know, you don't know why this tree is not per performing well. Is it not performing well because it's a tree of this size? Or is it not performing well because it was a greedily constructed tree that simply doesn't optimize anything? And uh, um, as, I, as I mentioned, not only there's no proof of optimality, there's no proof of nearness to optimality. So you don't know how close you are to optimality. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, these methods tend to do pretty poorly for imbalanced data, even after adjusting the parameters. Sometimes you, if you adjust the imbalance parameter to one extreme, then the trees it produces vote always positive. And then if you adjust the parameter all, you know, gradually all the way through to the other extreme, it pred predicts all negative, and you cannot get anything in between. So it goes like one small tweak to the imbalance parameter, it goes from predicting all positive to predicting all negative. And you're like, hey, there's no, no good tree in here that I can use. Uh, also, um, as I mentioned, um, CART tends to be more interpretable, but less accurate than C4.5, where C4.5 produces these un uninterpretable models by default. Okay, so modern decision tree methods don't have any of these issues. They have different issues, right? Um, the only issue with the modern decision tree methods is scalability because they're trying to fully optimize over this massive, massive space. Okay, so they aim for full minimization of the cost complexity objective, which is, this is the same cost complexity objective we went over before. So this is the fraction of misclassified points traded off with the number of leaves in the tree. So it's misclassification error regularized by sparsity. Now, the most recent method as of spring 2020 is called GHOST. It's a generalized and scalable optimal sparse decision trees. And the algorithm itself is very, it's, it's really complicated. Um, and so it's beyond the scope of the course, but I wanna give you a sense of what it is, just so that you know that you're up to date on, on decision tree construction. Okay, so these algorithms, um, they actually aim to fully optimize over all possible ways you could create these trees. And of course, there's a huge number of possible trees you can construct from these features, from all possible splits and all possible ways. Anyway, so the ghost algorithm not only optimizes the um, misclassification error traded off by sparsity, but it actually can handle any loss function you, you want um, that is monotonically increasing in the, in the errors, right? In, in the false positives and false negatives. So it can handle balanced accuracy, weighted accuracy, F1 score, precision, um, AUC, partial AUC, all kinds of, all, all different, you know, even custom loss functions. And it globally optimizes over these things to provable optimality. Um, and if it doesn't hit provable optimality, you get, um, you get a, a bound on how close it is to being optimal. The only issue is that it doesn't work for huge data sets because it's actually doing a full optimization over this massive search space. So it's considering every size of decision tree, every possible condition you can place on each split. Okay, it's not a greedy splitting and printing method. It's actually a sophisticated pairing of theoretical bounds for reducing the search space 
with techniques for careful storage and lookup of previously solved subproblems so that you don't have to repeat computations over and over again. And if you're familiar with this terminology, it's actually a dynamic programming algorithm that uses um, analytical bounds to try to chop off big pieces of the search space. Okay, so it, it actually has several uh, theorems that show that some partial trees can never be extended to form full trees that are actually optimal. So this is an example of the search space. So the search space, it, it has trees that are tiny, and then you could think about its children, like all possible children, and children of that, and so on and so forth. And the, these theorems, they actually take off chunks out of the search space so that you never have to actually search that part of the space. So it either enumerates the whole space or it you know, provably removes those whole parts of the space. And I'm gonna show you kind of a, one of the, probably the simplest bound um, in this collection of bounds that Ghost uses. All right, so uh, this is again our objective, which is uh, misclassification or traded off with sparsity. Now, this is a, a, a very simple theorem it's called the basic size bound. And it says that if somehow we previously encountered a tree with an objective value that was RC, so in other words, somehow in our traversal so far, we've come up with a tree that has an objective value RC, then any optimal tree tree star, which is a minimizer of the objective, obeys this theorem. So it says that the number of leaves in this optimal tree, so the number of leaves in any optimal tree, is less than or equal to RC over C floor. Okay, so what that's telling us is that I know once I have gotten a tree with objective RC that I never have to search trees that are that have more leaves than this because I know that they will be suboptimal with respect to the objective. Okay, I'll show you the proof. It's very, very simple. So again, tree star is the minimizer of R, so that's why it's always on the lower end. And then this is the definition of R that I just put in there. And then two terms is always bigger than one term, especially when the other term's positive, <laughs> or non-negative at least, right? Right, the, the error is non-negative, so if we eliminate, it only goes lower. And then um, from there, it's very simple. You just divide both sides by the regularization parameter. You know that the number of leaves is integer, so you put a floor on it. And that's it, that's the whole theorem. Okay, so that's, that's it. So anyway, so this is, this, again, it's, it's a very, it's, it's kind of the first of many theorems that tells you how to reduce the size of the search space by proving that you never have to look at trees that are too big because we know that they probably won't be optimal. Okay, and there are many other theorems in, this, uh, in, this, in these new algorithms, and the theorems prove that certain splits are not possible because they won't lead to accurate enough trees. Um, sometimes we can prove that one partial tree can never be extended to form a better tree than one that we've already seen. So for instance, we can prove that if we split on a certain feature, then it will never lead to an optimal tree, and, and there's a lot of theorems that, like that. Also, there are many isomorphisms of the same tree, because if you take the tree and you just permute, you know, if you just flip the leaves around in different permutations, then you actually get an isomorphism of the tree. You get a, a, an identical, or well, a tree that's equivalent to it. And as it turns out, we only need to work with one of this set of equivalent trees. And so we, we actually, in, in Ghost, we actually have a data structure that keeps track of symmetries so that you only have to process just one of every symmetric set of trees. Um, and there are other bounds that say, well, if you've, if you've already worked out all the computation for this computations for this tree, well, I have another tree. It's very similar to it. It's only off by this one factor, just slightly. And so um, you don't have to work out all the computations for that tree because we can, we can borrow uh, computations from the tree that we already worked on. Okay, so some advantages of Ghost. It's interpretable. It produces simple models that generalize well. It handles nonlinearities. It handles a wide variety of objectives, even custom objectives that the user can put in themselves. It also handles imbalanced data really well because 
it's again it's solving things to provable optimality and it again it has a proof of optimality or closeness to optimality so that if you stop it early you know kind of how close to optimal you were and it doesn't use splitting and pruning heuristics the disadvantages of these modern methods is that since they're solving these very very challenging optimization problems um, you, you can't prove optimality if you have a very large data set. And I should say you can't do that yet because that's, um, that's the state of where things are now. And maybe by the time you watch this video, we'll be able to handle data sets that are twice as big as when I made it. All right, thanks. <laughs>